king, the king of kings. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to another segment of Superstar Spotlight. I am, of course, uh, one of your co-hosts of Kings of the Rings podcast, King Ricky Rose, and I have a special uh, superstar guest with me. He uh, is billed at 6'8", 270 pounds um, from nowhere, Arizona, ranked in PWI's top 500 at number 459. Uh, he's worked for brands such as Chaotic Wrestling, uh, CW, Limitless, Rest- Limitless Wrestling, Beyond, uh, most notably Evolve at the current moment. He had a 322-day reign as the CW New England champion, and he was also a former A10 Gravity champion. He's had notable opponents, such as Flip Gordon, the current WWE NXT UK champion Walter, Donovan Dijak, uh, Angelo Dawkins of the Street Profits, Darby Allen, JT Dunn, MJF, All Ego, Ethan Page, AR Fox. We will get into a lot about you and AR Fox. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, current NXT signee um, Keith Lee, um, Ace Romero, current NXT champion Johnny Gargano, and also Mance Warner. And ladies and gentlemen, chances are he probably doesn't like you. This is Josh Briggs. Josh, how are you doing today? Good. That's a that's a hell of a introduction, man. I got I, a lot I, to I live try. up to. <laughs> I try. I try. All right. So I'm I'm noticing here on my research of you, you um you started wrestling specifically at the end of December of 2016. I believe December 14th was your actual debut, um in CW. Uh, so what what exactly got you into wrestling? Um. So when I was five years old, um I got these these uh, action figures. For yeah. professional wrestling, and I fell in love with them, and I wanted to watch the TV show that they corresponded with. Yeah. So um, once I uh, once I saw that TV show, I was hooked, and um, you know that that was like the the end all be all of uh, me becoming a pro wrestling fan. <laughs> fan. But, so what what transitioned you from fan into wrestler finally? Sure. So I was um, I was a college football player. I played Division One A football at uh, UMass Amherst, and um, after football, I um, uh, my junior year of football, I kind of realized I hated football. And oh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. It's, I don't know if it's um, if it's a consensus between most people that play football, but <laughs> yeah, I was not a big fan of football. And um, my junior year, I kind of checked out, and I was I was done. I, I was a starter and everything, and I just didn't – I was, wasn't having fun. And um, I looked into wrestling schools around the area, and mm-hmm. thank, thank God I was uh, in Massachusetts because it's pretty much the hub of pro wrestling in America. And yeah. um, The Northeast is a huge, huge hub of pro wrestling and pro wrestling schools. Yep. So, you know, I, I – um, my junior or my senior year, I contacted Brian Fury at the New England Pro Wrestling Academy, and um, that's uh, that's where I went and trained. You know, I trained with uh, him and uh, Mike Hollow, who mm-hmm. who uh, was the head trainer of Killer Kowalski's school once uh, Kowalski couldn't uh, get around too well. So um, I pretty much got the two best, uh, the best of both worlds as far as uh, training goes. Yes, and Killer Kowalski most noticeably, or most notably trained uh, one Paul Levesque. People know him as Triple H, yep. uh, now the uh, the COO of WWE. And Killer Kowalski uh, was noted for saying that you always have to do one thing to make yourself stand out from everybody else. Um, and I'm assuming that's where the whole chances are he doesn't like you thing came from. That makes you stand out. Where did where did that phrase come from? I've seen you wrestle in person, which we'll talk about, and you usually yell in your match at one point, I don't like you to your opponent. Where where did all of that just manifest itself? Um, so it, it was um I was wrestling for this company in Rhode Island at the time and mm-hmm. they wanted to give me a microphone and do a promo. So um It was my first live promo in front of a crowd, and uh, it was basically me doing an open challenge to see who would come out in the back. And uh, I think the the ending line of the promo was, I don't care who's coming out, the chance is I'm not going to like you. And that got a really good reaction, and for it being my first promo, it really stuck with me. And then uh, a couple people like... uh, that uh, saw it or, and that I trusted kind of molded it and we all made it, we made it my catchphrase. Rich Palladino was 
uh, who's the um, ring announcer for basically everywhere in New England. He's the best yeah. the time. Um, he's the one who came up with the introduction of chances are he doesn't like you, Josh Briggs. And, uh, you know, I like it. It's stuck. And, uh, you know, thankfully I've made a lot of money off of that saying. <laughs> yes, yes, you have. And, uh, I mean, chances are the way that you wrestle, you probably don't really like your opponent at all. So what, what would you describe is like your wrestling style? Um, I, I don't know. I'm like, uh, a, a lot, I'm a lot of different things. Um, I used to be super athletic until I uh, really got hurt. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that ain't happening too much anymore. <laughs> but um, um, I guess I'm more of a, a a brute grappler. You know, if that if that's a thing, a brawler. Um, I, I throw a lot of boots and a, a lot of a lot of strikes. But um, mostly everything I do targets the back. And, yeah. Uh, you know that's that's always been my game plan was back 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 back. Every wrestler on earth has a bad back, so uh, <laughs> you know I I'm um, really uh, I, I think I figured that one out. Yeah, I mean that's very Roderick Strong of you, aka oh, the Messiah of the Backbreaker. Oh, yeah. Your finishing move or one your most famous finishing move is the M5, oh, um, which that's. Uh, that's retired now. <laughs> Which I have heard has, has the M5 was known as like Maroon 5's uh, next greatest hit. Uh, yep. but it had a lot of iterations. It had a lot of iterations of the name. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, once it once it started getting really popular, I kind of I kind of took the silliness away from it mm-hmm. and just, just named it the M5. Still mm-hmm. give a little bit of an ode to, to, um, to the boys, but, you know, that's, I, I kind of had to, had to taper down the silly. It doesn't really work that well. <laughs> well, blame blame Ethan Page for that one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and everything. Um, so, uh, who are your who are your wrestling kind of inspirations? Who do you who did you when you were first started wrestling? I mean, you're still very green for all intents and purposes. Yeah, um, yeah. in the industry, but who who are the people you look up to who you tried to mold your style off of? Um, the Undertaker for sure was like my my go to big dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was the man, but um. Him, Barry Windham was a guy that I really watched a lot of when I was uh, early Very hard on. hitter. Super, like, athletic, um, big guy. And um, I got a lot of his mannerisms early on. Um, Donovan Dijak was, like, my, like, once I started hitting my spurt for indie wrestling, that yeah. was, like, the dude that I watched the most. And now it's a little bit of Chris Hero, a little bit of uh, Claudio Castagnoli. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little bit of everyone. Anyone over like six four that does some athletic stuff and can move really well, that's kind of kind of like my uh, my cauldron that I throw them into. But um, but yeah, it's 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 for the main. If I had to narrow it down to one, it's probably Taker. Gotcha. I mean, Taker's an inspiration in any form of wrestling, whether it's the entrance or the move set or anything. Of kind of that nature. Um, so I, I, you did mention Donovan Dijak. I saw that match where you pretty much sent Donovan um, on his way out, out of Limitless Wrestling um, to 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 out of it to NXT at that point, and that was actually a very a very crazy match to watch because you guys are both two massive individuals, two guys that you know put your bodies on the line. You dove over the top rope. You know, and that, I think that might have yeah. been the first time I ever did that live. <laughs> yeah, it was very Undertaker esque. So, so I mean, it, it was uh, that was a real test for me. Um, Dijak wanted to make sure I did everything I possibly could in that match. He wanted me to get every move I can, every um, athletic showing I could possibly do. He wanted to make me like the next guy in that match, and that match. Uh, that match boosted me pretty high up. Like, as far as my career goes, it's mm-hmm. defined by like career elevating matches, and that was like the first one that happened that sent me to the next plateau. Yeah, I mean, if it wasn't for Dajak and Ring, it was definitely MJF on commentary, just oh yeah, selling, selling like a madman. Yes. <laughs> Selling like an absolute man. Now I have to ask you, as I'm noticing the the surroundings in uh, in your living area right now, yeah. you have a big thing for Funko Pops. I'm a big Funko Pop collector. I, 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 I like. See. I don't. I don't grab everyone I see. I collect uh, certain series. 
Okay. And um, I try and try and like collect every single one in that series. So right behind me is a, a Dragon Ball Z collection. Okay. Um, I got almost every single one. That's a big prized possession for me. And right. um, in the living room, I have um, Game of Thrones. Okay. So you, know, you I, saw I, the I'm Battle of a- Winterfell. Oh man! Don't even get me started. On that. <laughs> but so, yeah, I'm, I'm a big uh, Funko Pop connoisseur as it goes. Good, good, good. All right. So, that's, so you have you have a little, little, little collection, little, little things there. So you wrestle primarily in the Northeast, right? Um, with you know, with your CW, your Limitless, your Beyond, uh, Evolve is just now expanding into the Midwest. Do you have any aspirations of kind of wrestling outside of the Northeast? Um, so yeah, right now I'm, uh, I'm wrestling, uh, in Canada a bunch. I'm basically everywhere in Canada. Um, I'm also at, uh, AAW in Chicago, yeah. which is, um, in my opinion, one of the, the top three independent wrestling companies in, uh, in probably the world. Um, there's a couple places I'd like to get out to in the West coast, but, um, you know, I, I for whatever reason, it really hasn't happened yet. It's a lot of uh, lining up the dates properly. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. Some people just might not want to buy that flight from, uh, uh, you know, Boston to to Los Angeles. And, it's an expensive or, flight. Or some people just don't think I'm, you know, worth the flight yet, and that, you know, that's that's their opinion. But um, um. A lot of a lot of it is just lining up those dates, and you know I'm I'm a super busy guy, and yeah, when when it when it comes to booking me, it, it's usually best to get me like six months ahead of time, and uh, unless someone cancels, which is very rare for me, um, then they can get me on that weekend, but it's that's a uh, very few and far between. Gotcha. Um, so you, what has been your best match in your opinion on the Indies that you've wrestled so far? Who was um, your opponent? What was the setting? What was going on? Um, I, I don't know. It, it's it's up there for one of my best matches. I'd I'd probably say it's a top three. But I guess the most special match to me was uh the my last match the the one where I uh, I wrestled Ar Fox at Laboom in Queens, New York, and uh, mm-hmm. um. It's special for a lot of reasons, and um, uh, I, I think uh, at least for for everyone that's talked to me about it uh, online and the people in the crowd and everything, they said that was one of the best matches in uh, in Evolve in a very long time. So um, I mean that's a big honor in itself. And um, every time me and Fox work together, it's always magic. I think he's a Mount Rushmore independent wrestler, one of the top like guys to ever do it, and. Um, you know, it, it, me being hurt, you know, it, it kind of added to the whole thing. It was a big learning experience for me, and it was something that I'll I'll remember and honestly cherish. Like I'll cherish like that injury. You know, it, it, it changed my entire life for the better. I think. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that because I and my co-host were in the crowd for that match. We were on oh, the stage. Yeah. You guys were tearing it up. We were just like, "What is going on?" You guys were kicking out of everything yep. like people are just like what what's gonna stop like what what's it gonna take all of a sudden you get back you get fox back into ring you're in the ring you're on the second rope you get the you get the hand over his throat you hit the m5 and then you go for the pin yep. and to to the naked eye no one knows anything's wrong at that point you go for the pin, you get the win. As soon as the three count hits, you rise up as much as you can and say, help me, help me, help yep. me, I'm hurt. So take us through that moment in time. Yeah, so I mean, that that's a move, that's a whole sequence that me and Fox have done a few times. I've done it with him uh, maybe three different times, um, and I've done it with other people a, a bunch as well. It was, a, it was a, a big staple in like a big match for me. Uh, yeah. And uh, I had it figured down to a science. I'd done that move so much that I knew exactly how to protect myself from it. Um, mm-hmm. But like I said, and like you said, that that match had like such a special feel. Like the the um, the emotion in my body and the adrenaline and the energy, all of that combined to make me want to um, do it. Do that move in a different way. When I'm on yeah. the ground with a lighter person, I'll always get my knees right under them and propel them off my body. Okay. Uh, when it was a heavier person or them coming off the top rope, 
I drop them across my shins and collapse my shins down. So it was more of a, a magic trick. Gotcha. Um, in that moment, I thought that um, it would be really, really cool to cap off that perfect match or close to perfect match with him bouncing off of my knees. And exploding um, out. Yeah. And, you know, it was just too much weight for my hips to handle. And um, mm. I think um, I, I had, had been having bad hip problems and bad uh, back problems. I was uh, seeing a chiropractor a bunch and uh, treating myself properly and doing yoga twice a week for an hour, mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as well as all my strength training that I do. And um, I was still having those bad back problems and bad hip problems. And it was because of that move. I didn't, I didn't really realize it until I got hurt. But that move had uh, really deteriorated my hip, uh, my hip mobility and uh, um, all of the muscles around it and encasing that hip and ball in that socket. Yeah. Um, that move was really destroying my hips. And like now when I see other people do a move where it involves the hips and that explosion, it's, it's uh, a little alarming because uh, I know the, the possibilities and uh, I can uh, – kind of tell what's going to happen if you keep doing it, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's you know, I, I just did it so often to so many people that I probably should have done it to that, right. you know, it, it really took a toll on me. And, uh, when, when I was in the hospital and everything and talking to the doctors and they, they all told me one, one more really wrong landing on that move. And I could have, uh, separated my spinal column from my, uh, from my pelvis and I could have, been yeah. Whoa, that's that's pretty that's pretty intense. I mean, the whole injury thing was pretty intense. I remember being very silent. Um, I remember you screaming in pain as they were trying to move you. Yeah, and, man, that was brutal. <laughs> and and you couldn't move. Um, you know, you're, you're you're lying down there on the floor. You're obviously at the most part either listening to people or listening to doctors or whoever, just looking up at like a light. Yep. At this point, what is going through your mind besides the pain and agony of this injury? Um. It wasn't even that painful until they started moving me. Um, mm -hmm. It was just really scary to not uh, be able to move my leg. So uh, for any of the listeners or watchers, um, mm -hmm. when I dislocated my hip, it was a posterior dislocation. So if this is on YouTube, you can just pull up another tab and watch a, what it looks like to have a posterior dislocation. But um, your legs are basically pinned together. The ball mm -hmm. that keeps your femur, your whole leg uh, attached to your torso, um, it was out poking through the side of my butt cheek. Ow. So my knees were touching together and I could not pry them apart. Oh. Um, and that was just extremely uh, un unnerving for me. And uh, I knew the whole time it was my hip and there was nothing else wrong. I mm -hmm. just really wanted to be able to straighten my legs out. So that was uh, really frustrating. And uh, but I, I had two of my two of my best friends in wrestling, uh, Anthony Green, uh, who slid right into the ring with me. That's like my my lifetime brother, and um, Jake Clemens, uh, who was the referee for that match. Yeah, uh, he was there as well, and we were just like all we were just talking, talking and talking, keeping me uh, keeping me uh, sane, I guess, and telling me jokes and making fun of me and all that. <laughs> but I guess like. Um, I just turned 26 in uh, on March 5th, so yeah. my my parents' insurance ran out. And uh, this match was March 13th, I believe. Oh no, March 16th. It was right before St. Patty's Day. Yeah, very very close. Yeah. So the week before my birthday, I got my own insurance. So wow. I was just really, really <laughs> worried that, like, the insurance didn't kick in and I was just going to get completely <laughs> screwed by this whole thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I lucked out with the insurance thing, too, as well. So if you're 25 going on 26, you don't know what the hell's going to happen. Get insurance. Yeah, you, you are a lucky man for that because I can't imagine uh, what that bill was like. So you, you dislocated your hip. Um, I remember also before we get past that moment i remember you at one point um as the crowd is watching you and we're getting emts and everything that they need for you which i think they did a phenomenal job of, of course getting you out of there safely like you know evolve runs on a pretty strict time frame 
Yep. From what I've seen of Evolve shows, uh, Gabe to, Gabe to make sure you guys are in and out. But for this, they actually did take their time, and I think the crowd and everybody was very patient with all with everybody with getting you out of there, and they got you out there in a pretty efficient manner. Of um, course. I remember you at one point after they had strapped you and you yelled, "I'm sorry." Yeah. To the crowd. Yeah. You know, uh, what, what were you trying to? I mean, you, obviously you were sorry, but what? Where? Where, where did that come from? I was just thinking about the whole show as a whole, and, you know, everyone says it, but uh, we all wrestle for the crowd. You know, we don't yeah. wrestle We don't wrestle for, like, our boss. We wrestle to please the fans. And um, I felt like in that moment that I took away a great match from them. Mm. And uh, I... Uh, I still feel this way that I that I uh, sullied the the rest of the card, which was an amazing card. It was. I, did, it was I didn't card. ever want you know I didn't ever want to make anything about me more than it should be. You know I'm in and I'm out. I want people to think about my match and think it was the best, but I don't want to ever bleed into other matches and take away from other performers or take away the magic that we're giving to the crowd. And yeah. I felt that my injury really, uh, um, it, it was a pretty pretty bad injury, and especially someone, I don't, I don't think anyone has ever seen me that, like, vulnerable, and I, I, I'm pretty sure it was a little, like, uh, unsettling for the crowd to see me like that, so I didn't, I just, I felt like I, I messed the show up getting hurt, and I felt like I took a lot away from the crowd. So You are, you are no. pretty stoic, you have that one kind of personality in the ring and did Rudy Gobert be like come here come here come here for a second I was like did he hurt Fox like is Fox okay and then we and then we found yeah. out it was actually you because um I think Ayla of the scope came in and like rushed in as yep. well because now you're thinking all right did did Fox really get messed up here because Fox sells like he's been shot out of a cannon half the right. time um so it was a lot of chaos and we realized it was you that was out. It was just it was a match scene, but we are glad you were okay. Um, you they gave you a diagnosis of two to three months of, yep. of recovery time. How is your recovery going? So that two to three months was very like bare bones. Like that should be the time where I'm starting to like move around as far as like really becoming an active human being again and doing mm -hmm. what I do, which is so much strength training and so much training and practice and wrestling three to four times a week, you know, that I don't, who knows how long that would, would be for the doctors to give me that diagnosis. But, um, I think, um, three weeks in, maybe two weeks in, I was able to walk on my own and that shouldn't have happened until, um, two months. Yeah. So, um, I was so far ahead of schedule and then, um, um, after after they after everyone saw that it was kind of like tossed like the the normal like playbook of a dislocated hip out the window and mm -hmm. let's just see what happens. So now I mean I'm I'm pretty much like knock on wood back to normal. Um, and, and this is pretty much in a month's time. Yeah, a little bit over a month, right between two months and a month. Um, it, it's almost unheard of. I, I'm I'm pretty sure it's probably unheard of for someone to to heal as quick as I have. Yeah, uh, you, you but, have a lot going for you. You're young, yeah. you're you, you you're athletic. Yeah, um, you've been athletic for a very very long time, so I think that kind of does really work in your favor. Yeah. Um, and uh, but it's even still, you you sep you dislocated your hip. Like that's not anything that people come back like just ligament damage and other things that have to like kind of you know fall in the fall into place and get re repaired and restructured mm -hmm. again. And the fact that you're back in one month is just it's that's mind blowing mentally. Yeah. You know what what really like worked well for for my case was um um a lot of the times when you dislocate your hip um your femoral head hits the socket the back end of your pelvis mm -hmm. and it'll crack and um you will have a, like a broken femoral head which is very severe and very hard to to attach. Yeah. So um that didn't happen with me very luckily and um the doctors in New York were, um, they gave me a CAT scan and x-rays and they were worried that there was going to be bone chips. And if I had yeah. bone chips, I was going to have a, to do a, um, a microscopic non-invasive surgery. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
I got um I got an MRI done here in uh, Milford, Mass, where I live, and um, uh, my orthopedic surgeon, who's one of the best with dealing with hips in the world, somehow, some way, got very lucky with that too. Um, he said there was no bone chips, and I was basically like ready to rock. And um, after uh, I think two weeks or three weeks, he told me to start going to physical therapy, and mm-hmm. um. After that, all I had to do was just repair the uh, the nerve damage and uh, the ligament damage and the muscular damage in that uh, that left butt cheek and everything around that hip, and uh, that's pretty much all I do every day. Is I hang, <laughs> hang out with my fiance and my cats, watch TV, and uh, go to the gym and repair my ligaments and butt cheek. That, that's that. Hey, that, that's that sounds like the life yeah. for some people. It's um, great. <laughs> so you, you. I mean, it seems like you're, you're, you're on a great road to recovery right now. So much to the point where, according to Evolve, you're wrestling next week. Yeah, I am. You know, have you been in the ring since the injury? Um, when I choke slammed Austin Theory, um, on WrestleMania weekend. Uh, for evolve one one twenty five, I believe uh, mm-hmm. that was uh, that was the first time I'd uh, been in a ring. Uh, that was the first time I was doing anything athletic. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know if my body was able to do that. Um, but um, after that, I've been in the ring. I've been taking bumps. I've been running the ropes. I've been uh, training people again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been pretty much doing everything normal, and uh, I feel I feel good. So, um, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what a hundred percent feels like anymore. Um, I don't know if I'll ever feel back to normal because mm-hmm. it was such a severe, severe injury, but, um, I, I feel like I can do everything to the best of my ability. Okay. So we're, we're going to test you out. Evolve likes to test their oh, contracted yeah. wrestlers, especially against some talent that the WWE has contracted as well. So your first official match back is May 10th in, uh, in Michigan, in Livonia, Michigan. Um, Evolve's, you know, really moving into the Midwest these days. Yep. Um, and you're going up against a Brazilian uh, jiu-jitsu hard-hitting master, uh, Adrian, Adrian Jod. That's your first match. Yeah. Um, not the easiest match to start up with. Of course not. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever like been in the ring with someone who's like a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner, and let alone like a like a god of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So, so I don't know how like my leg or my body will react. I'm sure. I'm sure I'm gonna find out. <laughs> yeah. But um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I guess with that one. Yeah, and then the next night, May 11th, Indianapolis for Evolve. Um, 128. You're facing. Uh, you're facing against what has been described as a dream opponent for you. Yeah. Uh, Cassius Odo, formerly known as Chris Hero, on the Indies, one of the hardest hitting wrestlers you'll ever see. I was there. Uh, I forgot what's involved when it was him against Darby Allen, and I thought for halfway through the match, Darby Allen died. Yes, just I'm, from taking. Darby hits. did almost die in that match. <laughs> let a little, a little bit anyone know he almost did die. <laughs> Yeah, I like for a second I was like, all right, he's killing him. He, this is a murder in the ring. Nice. Um, but Darby uh, somehow kept kicking out at one until he couldn't kick out at one no more. So yeah. you're going up against a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guy who's known for hard strikes against one of the most lethal strikers in the history of independent wrestling. How do you feel about that? I feel great, man. I, I've always been. Uh... If you ask anyone who's really close to me, like they all know that I want to be remembered as one of the toughest wrestlers to ever, ever wrestle. I want to mm. be remembered as I want to. I want to go down in history as one of the toughest human beings to ever wrestle. Um, and um, you know, I, I really enjoy working hard, and I really enjoy uh, getting hit hard, and uh, I really enjoy a really good test. So um, this is all very, very exciting for me. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's it hasn't been too long that I don't think I've lost a step. Um, it's just all it all depends on uh, how well my hip wants to react. You know, it, mm-hmm. worst case scenario, it gets really really sore. Uh, luckily, you know, all, yeah. all the work I've been doing on it, it's kind of locked back into place. But um, 
uh, I'm just extremely excited to to be able to wrestle again and to be able to wrestle two dudes of that caliber. Yeah. Now they said they, I've been hearing that Cassiano is a dream opponent of you. Is he the ultimate dream opponent of yours, or who is your like big dream opponent that you'd love to face? So, um, when I first started like making a name for myself on the indies, right before uh, Chris Hero got signed, mm-hmm. uh, him and Donovan Dijak were my two like my my two like dream opponents because they were like the dudes that I wanted to emulate and I really just wanted to wrestle those dudes and like hear how much I needed to learn from them. But um you know once he got signed I kinda thought it was like a wrap. I didn't I didn't think I'd ever wrestle him again. And yeah. so it kind of evolved into different other wrestlers who I guess have now since gotten signed as well. So, um, you know, I guess it all circles back. And now, yeah, Chris Hero, uh, who is Cassius Ono, is uh, pretty much the top guy right now. Okay. All right. So, um, it, let's say, you know, you, 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 face, you face Adrian, you face, you face Cassius. You know, all of a sudden, WWE comes knocking at your door. They they wanna they wanna at least give you a tryout. Have you ever? Is that the what is is that the end goal for you? Is the end goal for you after wrestling the Indies and doing something? Is the end goal for you to go to WWE to go to NXT? Have you thought about that just yet? Um, I've I've definitely thought about it, and I I guess it is the end goal. But um, this kind of goes back to my football training. All the success I had in football was when I was focused on doing the task at hand and never really, really like looking at, oh, am I going to get signed? Am I going to get a phone call from uh, a football, uh, NFL team, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of don't really put any eggs into the basket of the future. Um, you know, who know, who's to say that I won't dislocate my hip again and have to have to quit wrestling? Yeah. So, um I just want to have like the best matches I can physically possibly have every single night and uh, build up my fan base and give the crowd everything that they enjoy and everything they want and hopefully get them to come to every single show that I'm on. And, um, you know, once that happens, I think, you know, if the WWE wants me, then they, they want me and I'd love to, I'd love to work for them. But, well, you know, um, half the roster at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most. most of the roster, so. <laughs> um, so, I mean, outside of wrestling, I mean, you you're collecting Funko Pops. What are some of your other hobbies and talents that you like to in, engage in? Oh, I'm a big uh, movie buff. Me and my fiance, we always try to go to go to movies and everything. Um, but we're both homebodies, and uh, we have two cats that um, we love to spend as much time as possible with. So. Um, that's a lot of what we do when we uh we binge watch things on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime, any of those streaming services. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I'm on the road. I'm on the road a lot, so uh, I I like to stay home and spend as much time as possible with her. And then uh, um, we usually go to the gym every day and uh, get mm-hmm. a two hour workout in or so. And then uh, before I was injured, I was doing yoga twice a week. Yeah. So that was always a really fun, fun little thing that I used to do. But uh, the old, the old hip and not being able to walk for two weeks really took a toll on my hamstrings. You know? <laughs> my Tighten up a little bit. Yeah, my flexibility is uh, down the drain. So I gotta, gotta start that all over again, which will be great. A little back to square one. Yeah. Um, so. Um, before we, you know, start wrapping up, I want to thank you again for taking some time out of your day and your busy schedule for, uh, for, for talking with me and for having our listeners and the people who are going to see us on YouTube get a chance to kind of get to know you and what you've been doing, um, send, with your time off, your unfortunate time off <laughs> at the moment. So my final question for you is, is, um, what do you want the people to know about Josh Briggs who have never seen or heard of, the, of you before? What do you want them to know? Hmm. That's a million dollar question. Um, I want everyone that, uh, that's watching this or listening to this that doesn't know who I am or anyone who ever discovers this who doesn't know who I am, I want them to know that, uh, professional wrestling is one of the most important things in the world to me. Um, I would kill myself for it if I could. Um, it's given me things that I could never, ever dream uh, of getting. With, without professional wrestling, I wouldn't have the life that I have now, and that's uh, the most important thing in the world to me. Um, I'd also like for you guys to 
understand the sacrifices that uh, me and all of the other wrestlers make, um, mm-hmm. taking time away from from uh, our families and uh, uh, destroying our bodies to make you guys happy. And uh, if you ask any of us, we're, we're glad to do it and have no qualms about it. It's just wrestling's the best, and without the fans, it's kind of it's kind of worthless, I guess. And uh, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt if you you watched uh, a couple of my matches and became a fan. Um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully you see a little uh, a little Josh Briggs action and uh, you become a fan. If not, you know, it's not for everyone, but I think it's for most people. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like there's a spot in wrestling for everybody, and we will for uh, for some. I, I, the Patreon users have already seen some because I've been leaking them like crazy in our Patreon chat. Oh, yeah. But on our on our Twitter page, we will be releasing some of the uh, some of Josh Briggs' greatest indie hits, including the Donovan Dijak uh, matches, his uh, little ten minutes uh, soiree with a Darby Allen up in uh, up in Portland, Maine. Um, also, oh, one, uh, one of my uh, one of my all time favorite matches just got released. Um, it's me versus Kurt Stallion at. Beyond wrestling, nice. Uh, so, so that one's that one's free on uh, free on YouTube right now. So yes, that's and also a- also check out probably his hardest hitting match that I've ever seen. Um, speaking of liking to take hits, him against Walter. <laughs> oh yes, oh my god, <laughs> that's a fun one. One of my favorites. I learned so much in that match; it's ridiculous. You made Walter actually wrestle instead of hit people. Yeah, which is really man. hard to do. <laughs> what a good match! I loved that match. That match yeah. did a lot for me. <laughs> yes, it, it was pretty crazy. So, ladies and gentlemen, chances are he probably doesn't like you, but he loves to wrestle. This has been Superstar Spotlight with Josh Briggs. Josh, where can they find you on social media? Uh, everything is at the Josh Briggs. And if you want to have a little bit more personal interaction or get a, a good look into my real life, uh, Josh Briggs on Facebook. You can just uh, send the ad over, friend request, and I'll, I'll usually accept you if you're not a weirdo. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, anything like that. I like to talk to fans and uh, interact and everything and get to know you guys. So uh, feel free to talk to me. Yes, and when the next time you come to the New York City area to Evolve La Boom, you will be seeing the Kings of the Rings podcast yeah. there in all of our glory. So we would love to kind of meet up with you in person if that is possible. With your I'd love schedule. to, man. I'd love to. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, this is again Josh Briggs. This has been Superstar Spotlight on Kings of the Rings podcast.